Something, does prayer work? Does prayer really work? This, this is a question. I mean, we can be real. We can be honest. We can, we can be open about this and say, hey, we've all probably found ourselves in a situation or in a period of life, or maybe your entire life, where you ask this question of, does prayer really work? And I'm not going to take a super spiritual bend to this sermon. I, this isn't like, uh, yeah, let's, we're going to be real here. This is going to be real. We really want to ask this question because this, this thing here, does prayer really work? I mean, a lot of our faith in Jesus hinges on this. A lot of what we believe as Christians hinges on this. A lot of what non-Christians are people that, that maybe have been hurt by the church or they don't come to church or they don't want anything to do with God, they also ask the same thing about us. People in other religions ask the same question. They want to know, does, does prayer really work? You know, the other question that I have is, does prayer really do any good? Does it matter? Does it matter if we pray? Now, it's... Again, let's, I want to tease all the things out in us that we think, that we, that, that we automatically think so many times where we pray for something and we say, does it really do any good? Does it really, does it really help? Does the fact that I get down on my knees and I pray, does that actually do anything beneficial? You know, because it's easy for us to feel like our prayer is just bouncing off the ceiling, right? And we wonder like, well, does prayer, does prayer even work? And see, I believe that that we've been on this journey of getting to know Jesus. And as we get to know Jesus, then we get to form opinions and ideas around these things. Because it's, when we started this journey a few weeks ago, I thought it's not fair for someone to form an opinion about Jesus when they don't really know Jesus. And so I don't want to make you know Jesus. I don't want to make you choose Jesus. I don't want to make you choose that prayer is good for your life. Instead, I want to introduce you to Jesus, and I want to introduce you to what this means for us as a church and Christians, and then let you make that choice for yourself. And I, I think, I don't know, I pray and I hope that it helps. But one thing that, that I do know is that our relationship with prayer reflects our understanding of our relationship with Jesus. So if you knew Jesus more, or if you knew Jesus better, would that change the way you prayed? If you knew how much he loved you or how much he was for you, or you had a better understanding around the nature and the Holy Spirit that, is, that, that we get with Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, would you pray differently? Would that change the way that you pray? The fact that, that maybe you don't understand how your prayers aren't getting past the ceiling at home, well, you know what? I would say there's nothing wrong with you, but maybe there's just an aspect of Jesus to get to know better. Maybe that's all it is. So why, do we, why, why is it hard for us to pray? So we find it hard to pray because oftentimes we think, well, I've got to be more disciplined. I've got to, I've got to get up early in the morning. I've got to carve out 10 minutes here. I've got to carve out 20 minutes there. I've got to make sure that I, okay, I'm not a morning person, so I'm going to do it in the evening or I'm going to do it in the afternoon. Uh, so I'm going to pray, you know, or we think like, man, I really should, should not watch, you know, as much YouTube or I should, instead of listening to this podcast when I drive, I should be praying on, on the way to, to work or to wherever. But we get this idea of like, if I were just more disciplined, then I would pray more. If, if I were more disciplined, I would be able to push through why it's hard for me to set time aside to pray. And, and it's something that we carry around. And I'll tell you what that is. That is... That is, a, that is a hidden form of shame and guilt. Because anytime you're, you're in a situation where you think, if I were just more, then I would be better for God. Or I would be a better Christian. Or I would pray better. Or I would have more time to pray. Or it wouldn't feel so hard to pray. But that's shame. That's guilt. That's not from God. Because prayer is something that's easy. It's something for us to take to God. It's something just easily for us to, to come into contact with Him. And it doesn't have anything to do with discipline. It doesn't have anything to do with, with whether or not you carve out five minutes or ten minutes or two hours or whether or not you fall asleep with your head on the Bible and you just trust that God's Word transposes through the book and into your forehead and into your brain. That counts. I, I believe that that counts. But I think the real reason why we find it hard to pray is that we don't actually understand, we don't understand the power of prayer. We don't understand it. We don't know it. 
We don't actually know what comes when God gives us this ability. We don't know what it means when God says, I'm going to open up a channel for you so that you can communicate with me. And you know what? Even when you don't know what to pray for, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to you and he's going to take your struggles and your issues and the Holy Spirit is going to groan in front of the throne of God on your behalf. If we knew that, we would not find it hard to pray. If we knew that, we would walk around all day on tippy toes with fairy dust coming off of us. and We'd be like, I'm invincible. I've got, I've got the creator of the world, the creator of the universe that I can just talk to. Now, if that's not you, if you don't know that, if you've not walked in that truth, shame on you. No, I'm kidding. Not shame on you. You're just like me then. You're, we're the same. It's okay. It's okay to be that way. It's, it's, it's natural. It's fine. I don't want you, I don't want anyone sitting there thinking like, man, that dude is right. I'm horrible at this. I'm a whore, I, you know, I, no, one, no one should carry that. No one carries that. Instead, I want to paint a picture of hope for you so that you can say, you know what? I like that picture. I like what I'm hearing. I'm going to choose that. I'm going to choose to believe that. that. That's what I want you to take on. That's what I want you to feel. So prayer can also for us be a little bit confusing. So this is another area where I want to get real. There's three different scenarios that we, that we live by in prayer. This is something that I kind of thought about. These three different scenarios. Scenario number one, this is the magic scenario, okay? You pray and something happens. Isn't that amazing when that happens? It doesn't happen often, but when you do, you're, it's like, I, I'll never forget one time I was living in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I had this little Subaru, and I had sold all my stuff, and I was, I was doing some intern work with an organization that I was going to move to South Africa to work for. And I was, I was living in this little one-bedroom kind of trailer. It was actually an office trailer, and they kind of gave me an office, and that was the bedroom that I was staying in. And it was on a, a church property. And one morning, I got into my car, my Subaru, and I, I, or Subaru, as you guys call it. And I started it up, and the check engine light came on, and it was like stuttering. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And I turned the key off, and I just thought, what if I prayed and God healed my car? And this was not a super spiritual moment. This was like one eye open, kind of like, is this going to work? Is this not going to work? And I put my hand on the dash, and I said, Lord... I just heal this car. And I turned the key back on, check engine light was off. I thought, I'm done. I'm out. That's it. That's the pinnacle of life right there. I prayed and then something happened. And when this happens, you just feel like, ah, oh, that's amazing. That feels so good. It's rare, but it does, it does happen. So that, that's our favorite scenario. We want every scenario to be like this, where when we pray, something happens. This is, this is gold here. This is what we want. But then I think there's one that's even better, and it's scenario number two, where you forget to pray and something happens anyway. So this is something that I get to participate in because a lot of people from church will be like, hey, pastor, thanks for praying for me. You know, the job came through and I'll be like, uh, yes, uh, yeah, we were praying so hard. We were, we were praying. No, I, I, I don't lie to you guys as a, as a church, but sometimes we forget or I forget. And I'm like, oh, you know, I told, I told that person I'd pray for him and I didn't. And then something good happened anyway, you know. And if we look in our lives, we can see situations like this where, you know, someone comes up to you and says, you know, hey, will you pray for me about this? I'm trying to, I, I'm, I'm hoping that this thing comes into my life or, the, you know, whatever it is. And you forget, you tell them, I'm going to pray for you. And you forget to and then you know, something good happens anyway. I mean, that, this is like luck. You know, the first one is favor, where you pray and something happens. We could call this like Holy Spirit luck, where someone, you know, comes and says, hey, you forgot, but it happened anyway. Now, the third scenario, this is the one that, that we feel like our whole lives are in. And it's this, you pray hard and then nothing happens. So this is where most of us feel like we spend the majority of our time. Where we're like praying and like, Lord, come on, I need this. Don't you see that I need this? And we're just pouring our guts out and we're praying so hard, but nothing happens. I mean, it just feels like dead air, like silence. This is where you say, okay, my prayers, they don't leave the ceiling. They just hit the ceiling and they bounce back down. I feel like my life is lined with trampolines. So not only do my prayers hit the ceiling and just get stuck there, but they actually just bounce and come right back down to me. And so you have these three different scenarios, but 
What's the constant? Well, the constant in the three scenarios is prayer. But something different can happen at any point in time. You can pray and God can do something. You can forget to pray and something can happen anyway. Or you can pray and nothing at all happens. And so the question that leaves us asking that I would ask you this is, is there an actual connection between your prayers and what happens or does not happen? This is a great question to ask. This, this is a safe question to ask. As, as, as Christians or Christ followers, and even people that aren't Christians or Christ followers, you can ask this question. Is there any connection at all between what I pray for and what happens or doesn't happen? And based on those three scenarios, it's easy to get to this point where we wonder this question. This is, this is logical. It's okay to think, man, does it even matter? Is, does, it, does it even matter if I pray? So the only place that I know where to turn to to help answer some of these questions is it's not, it's not me. It's not my example. It's not anything to do with, you know, Casey and I. Oh, by the way, tomorrow's Casey's birthday. I just want to throw that out there. Yeah. 42. <laughs> For those of you that are online, my wife's in the back moderating right now, and, and she's, she's not turning 42. She's turning 37. I can't wait till we're all back in person. I just can't wait till we got the, the full building again. That's when Casey sits on the front row right here next to where Bruce would be. And she just gives me these eyes and that tells me to stop or to move on or to, you know, or whatever. So we're going to look at Jesus. We're going to look at Jesus in prayer. There's actually a place in the Bible. There's a place in scripture where we can find the definitive starting point for where Jesus introduces prayer to the disciples. So this is the point where Jesus actually teaches prayer. So we take it for granted because we're Christians and we've grown up in the church and we're a part of the church. And even those of us that haven't grown up in it, we've been around it enough that we just think, okay, church, prayer. Christ follower, prayer. You know, even other religions, prayer is attached to every religion. It's attached to them all. So it's like, where did that come from? Where did that start with? Where's the point where Jesus actually said, this is what prayer should be. This is what prayer should be like. And in this, we find something incredibly free and incredibly open. Because again, we're going to learn about who Jesus is. We're going to learn something about his character. And when we learn something about his character, it's going to open up uh, a whole new insight in how we pray. And so we're going to start out in Luke 11. So... It's important here, so Luke chapter 11 tells me, because it's not chapter 1, it's chapter 11, that tells me that the disciples have been with Jesus for half the book of Luke. So if you chronologically think about this here, the disciples have already done stuff with Jesus. This isn't their first encounter with him. They've been with Jesus for a while. This isn't Luke chapter 1, this is Luke chapter 11. People, they've been with him. They've watched him. They've seen the feeding of the 5,000. They've, they've participated in Jesus' his miracles. They've seen him do amazing things. And we come to this place here where the disciples have watched Jesus pray over and over and over and over again. They've watched him. And they've seen things happen as he's prayed. And they've even heard John the Baptist, this guy that came before Jesus, that baptized Jesus, that some of his followers knew how to pray. And so after seeing Jesus do all this, one day, it happened while Jesus was praying in a certain place. So Jesus has, has kind of tucked himself away, and he's praying. And the disciples, they're sitting there with him, and they're, they're just creepily watching, you know, I wonder, because it says, in a certain place, and after he finished, one of the, of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So the disciples let Jesus finish praying, and then they say, hey, we want, we want part of that. We want to be a part of that. Teach us how to pray. And I believe that teach us how to pray, it was more than just teach us what you say or teach us the words. It was also, we want to participate in this. We want to be a part of what you're doing. We want some of this that you're doing. We see that you go here and you go to this space and you get up early in the morning and you tuck your way alone and you pray and we watch you do that. We've been watching and we want to participate. So teach us how to participate in prayer. And so Jesus answers them this. 
He says, then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend. Okay, so Jesus says, yes, I will teach you how to pray. Then what Jesus does is he teaches them what we know of as the Lord's Prayer. It's like everybody, most people in church know it. Our Father who art in heaven, that prayer. So Jesus says, here's that prayer. And if you study that, it's more of a framework. So Jesus is teaching them priorities, priorities in prayer. But he, he gives them this prayer. And then after that, he says, you know what? I want to make sure that you can apply this to your life. So I'm going to give you a real life example so that you can apply it. And Jesus didn't just want to tell them, this is what you pray, or this is how you pray, because he knew what they were going to be up against. He knew that there would be days where they would be praying and nothing would be happening. He knew there'd be days when they would forget to pray and things would happen. And he knew that there would be days when, he would, when they would pray and they would call out to him and he would answer. But Jesus wants to make sure that they've got a few fundamental things in place. And so he teaches them through a story. A story that they would understand intimately well. He teaches them some things about prayer. And he says to this, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight. Now, midnight was not 12 a.m. It wasn't midnight. Midnight for them was the middle of their night. So they have already been asleep for, I don't know, four hours, five hours at this point in time. So Jesus goes to them, or he says, Go that you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and you say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. Now, I personally have a few issues with this. If I put myself in the shoes of the friend, I'd be like, A, why's somebody coming to you at midnight? B, why why are you hungry at midnight? It's like late night munchies here. Um, You know, I would be asking, you know, all, all these different questions. And so Jesus paints this picture and he says, okay, imagine that, you're, that you know these people in this home. In the middle of the night, you get woken up to somebody knocking and a friend of yours or a person of yours, an acquaintance of yours is at your door. And he says, hey, some dudes came over to my house and they want food, but I don't actually have any food. So can I have three loaves of bread from you? And then Jesus goes on in the story. And he says, and suppose the one inside answers, hey, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. See, anyone that has a baby, anyone that's grown up with a baby in their house, the house that we previously lived in, when, when, when the baby went down, if you made a noise, you were dead. If you woke that child up, it was just terminated. You were dead. You were terminated. Now in our current house, we have the same system, but it's a bit of a bigger house, so we have a little more leeway. But if you come visit our house uh, in the evening after Benjamin's gone to bed, we don't even bring you through the front door because I'm afraid that the echo of the door is going to go down the hallway and it's going to wake Benjamin up. So we bring you through the side door. And so every time people come over and they walk towards the front door and then we just shoulder and steer them to the side door, and we say, yeah, we don't use the front door. You know, I don't, we don't want to wake the baby up. And so here, in their time, they're all sleeping in one room. This is like mom, dad, the kids, everybody's in one room, one bed, one pallet, one arrangement, and someone's knocking on the door, and he's like, hey, the door's already locked. The kids and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. That sounds reasonable to me. That sounds like, yeah, that makes sense. I can... I could understand that. So Jesus goes on with the story. And he says in verse 8, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, so this is not a midnight, a midnight friend. You know, we all have, some of us have friends that, that if something happens even in the, in the middle of the night, you can call that friend and they'll come and they'll help you out. But those are few. Those are few in between. You know, we, we have a friend like that. My friend Sean, one of our elders, One night, it just so happened that Casey's car was in the shop getting fixed, and then my car had to go in the shop and get fixed, and there was one day of our entire lives that we've had zero vehicles. And on that day, Benjamin got crazy sick. And we we called the pharmacy, they sent the wrong medication, they sent the wrong dosage, and I'm like, I mean, I'm just, I'm losing it. I'm like, we we have no vehicle. We have no way to get anywhere. And at like 11 o'clock at night, I called Sean, And I said, man, we need help. And he dropped off a car for us. Didn't even bat an eye. It was amazing. He just said, here, here's a car. 
I mean, that, that's a midnight friend. Well, this is not, this friend in this story is not a midnight friend. He's saying, go away. Leave me alone. You're not a midnight friend. You are a pain. Go away. My kids and I are asleep. And so Jesus says, he's not going to give you bread because of friendship. He's going to give you bread because of your shameless audacity. He will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So then Jesus goes on to say, so I say to you, ask and keep on asking and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. And then Jesus finishes in verse 10 and he says, for, for everyone who keeps on asking persistently. Now this is the amplified translation. And those of you that have been around here a while, you know that I love it because it just adds context into what you're reading and so persistently, that's what the text is inferring, is that for everyone who keeps on asking, persistently receives. And he who keeps on seeking, persistently finds. And to him who keeps on knocking, persistently, the door will be opened. So Jesus has painted a picture here. He's painted a picture for the disciples of this story of this, this guy that has come in up and he's asking for something and it doesn't make sense. Culture should say this shouldn't happen. Society should say that this shouldn't happen. There's no reason for this guy to open the door. And Jesus even says, hey, he's not, he's not going to get the bread that he wants because of friendship or because of relationship or because of love or because of care or because of whatever else. He's going to get the bread that he wants because he's just persistent. He's going to annoy the guy until he gets it. Now, an interesting thing about the bread is that a loaf of bread was a valuable thing. And so not only is he asking for bread, like this isn't, you know, 15 rand, 25 rand from Quick Spar. This is something that's like this loaf of bread would feed a family for an entire day. And he's asking for three of them. And so God's told this story and he's painted this picture and we're going to dissect this out a little bit. But God, see, God delights. God delights to share his power with those who are bold enough to bother him and keep bothering him. That's, that's the picture that Jesus wants to paint. God delights to share his power with those who are bold enough to bother him and keep on bothering him. It's not super spiritual. It's simple. And God's trying to paint this picture to the disciples. Jesus is trying to paint this. He's like, just bother me and keep on doing it. Persistently knock. Persistently ask. Just keep doing it. And so based on this story here, I've, I've picked out three crucial truths about prayer. And we're going to take these three crucial truths and we're going to look at the specifics of this story. We're going to dissect it. And it's this is, where, this is where I get excited because I'm going to challenge you guys on these three things because I believe that maybe if, if you knew more about these three things, it would change the way that you prayed. And in this story, this is where Jesus is actually teaching the disciples and he wants, to under, he wants them to understand these three things and how these things impact the way that he wants them to pray, to pray because he wants them to know that they can come to him. They can come to him uh, with, with everything that they are. And so, our three crucial truths about prayer are this. Prayer should be desperate, it should be bold, and it should be persistent. Desperate, bold, persistent. Now, I'm not going to over-spiritualize this. This is real life. We should pray desperately, we should pray boldly, we should pray persistently. Now, if we know what that means, I bet we'll pray more. If we know we have permission to do this, I bet we'll pray more. So let's start with desperate prayers. Desperate prayers. One of the things that keeps us from praying is simply this. We fail to recognize how utterly desperately we need God's help. So in the story that Jesus has told about the man, it wasn't a situation where the man walked up and he asked for bread and he was told no and then he went off somewhere else. He knew that th that was his only chance for bread. That was the only time that he was going to be able, that was his only opportunity. It's midnight. It's like they, they, they're living that lockdown curfew life where they don't have, they can't run down to the petrol station and get a snack or get food. It's closed. So this guy is desperate. He says, hey, I desperately need this from you. I'm just going to keep on knocking. I'm going to keep on asking. Even though you say no, even though we're not really midnight friends, I'm going to keep asking. Desperate prayers. I'll tell you how I've seen this in my life. This works. How many, how many of us can just own up to and be honest about 
situations where we've desperately prayed and we've needed God, moved, God to move. Those are those times where we feel like maybe our prayers hit the ceiling or maybe we feel like that they bounce off the trampoline and they come right back, back down to us. I've been there and it's okay to admit that. I'll never forget when we lived in Newlands one night, I just desperately needed God to move. I desperately needed him. I'd been battling so much anxiety and so much depression. We were trying to start a church. The church wasn't coming. We were just alone. And I'm in this house in New Orleans, and I, I think maybe my parents were visiting, but I was just consumed, and I was just, God, why won't you take this from me? Why won't you help me? Why won't you set me free from these things that I feel and this stuff that's just consuming me? Just living in a panic attack 24-7. And I went, and I got in the bathtub, and it wasn't, I wasn't going to soak my feet and, you know, just light a candle and drink a glass of wine and unwind. No, I ran a bath. And I got in it and I just put my head under water. Because when I put my head under water, I could drown out the world. Now I wasn't trying to drown myself, so chill out. But I was trying to drown the world. I was so desperate for God to do something in my life that I was, I was just dunking my head under water to try and get away from the world that I was living in. Many mornings in that same house, I mean, I still go by that house today. Uh, you know, often I think about the times that I had in that house. In that same house, I'd get up early in the morning and lay in the floor in this little office that I had. And I just couldn't understand why God wasn't helping us to start a church or start and grow a church. Or why God wasn't setting me free from anxiety. Or why God wasn't answering prayers for Casey's visa. Or why we, why we were stuck in the situations that we were stuck in. I'm like, God, why aren't you doing this? And I would lay it on the floor and I was just desperate. And I'll never forget one time I just said, I finally broke. And I just said, God, I actually can't carry this. The mantle that you've put on me, I actually can't, I can't carry this. I don't want it. I do not want it. I spent years in desperate prayer. Now we desperately want to see God move. But are we, are we okay to be honest enough to pray desperately? Are we okay to admit that we're in a desperate situation so that we have to desperately need God? Because if God answered all my prayers when I prayed them, I would never be in a desperate situation. And when we finally admit and own up to and accept the fact that we desperately need our Lord and Savior, and when we do that and we become desperate for Jesus, then God moves in our life. Now I look back on that season, I still have desperate moments in my life, lots of them. But when I look back on that season of desperation, one of the seasons of my life of desperation, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Because when I, when I prayed desperate prayers, God did amazing things, and He loved me desperately. He took care of me, and He did ease my mantle. He did take things off my shoulders. He did help me out. And so by Jesus telling us this story, he wants us to come to him desperately. That's why he says, keep knocking, keep asking, be persistent, don't give up, be desperate, be ugly desperate. You know where you're crying, you got snot coming out of your nose, you know, and you're making that noise and you can't get your world together. Be that, be that to Jesus. Just keep knocking. It's okay. If we accept that we can do that, if we learn that we can do that, that Jesus actually wants that. And as a loving father, he's like, yes, man, I'm, I got you there. That'll change the way we pray. Now, the second thing is bold prayers. Bold prayers. This is one of my favorites. There's a quote, uh, a favorite quote of mine from a book called Circle Maker. And it says, if your prayers are not impossible to you, then they're offensive to God. And it's like, if, if what you're believing in or what you're praying for, if there's any shred of you that can figure it out on your own, then it's yours and it's not God's. Dream bigger. I love when people come to me and they're like, man, I have this passion. I have this dream. You know, I want to go do this or do that. And I'm like, you're talking to the wrong person. You're talking to someone that sold everything that he has, moved to a different country, Married an amazing woman who was a bit of a, a, a mess as a missionary, but there was, Casey's not a mess, but she was, I can't see her, so I'm fine. <laughs> but it was scary. It was scary to marry Casey. 
Because she was like this amazing woman, but it was this bold, I had to be bold. And so when people come to me with their hopes and dreams, I'm like, man, they usually, about halfway through the conversation, they've checked out because they're like, this dude's telling me to sell everything I have and leave everything I have and just go be bold. Yes, I am. I am telling you to do that. When we understand who we are, from whom we are asking, we will pray boldly. We will ask big because the closer the relationship, the bolder the asking. This takes me back to the three loaves of bread. You know what? That guy could have gone up and he could have asked for a half a loaf of bread, but he didn't. He asked for three loaves of bread. Why did he ask for three loaves of bread and not a half a loaf of bread? Because God wanted to illustrate the fact that he wants us to be bold. I don't want a half loaf life. I want a three loaf life. I want to take my three loaf request to God and not take my half loaf request to God. Because I believe, and Jesus is wanting us to understand that when we think that we're being bold, we're like, okay, a half loaf, maybe I'll ask for a loaf and a half. That, that's like, that's pushing it a little bit. Maybe I'll just push the boundaries a little bit. Loaf and a half, okay, two loaves, two loaves, God. Two loaves, I'll ask, okay, I'll ask for that, that kind of prayer. And God is saying, no, 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 more. I want you to be bold. I want you to ask for more. I want you to believe in more. I want you to understand this, whom we are asking. We are asking from the person, from, from God, the person that created the universe, that created everything that we have. Are you praying boldly? Are you asking bold prayers? If your prayer doesn't make you just want to vomit, because it's like, oh my goodness, if that actually happens, you know? But I don't want a three loaf life, or I don't want a one loaf life, I want a three loaf life. And Jesus wants us to ask for that. Don't come to me, your heavenly father, and ask me for beans. I want you to come to me, your heavenly father, and ask for an abundance of provision. That's the kind of loving God that we serve. Now, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I've got to hurry. But the last one here is persistent prayers. Persistent prayers. God, you are the only one who can help me. Huh. That's a statement that I don't know why it takes us so long to get there. Why does it take so long? Why does it take so long for us to get to the place where we make this statement? Yeah, I know it takes, it takes me forever. You think I would learn, but I don't. I have to relearn and relearn and relearn. And finally, I get to a place where I say, God, you are the only one who can help me. I'm not going anywhere else because there is nowhere else. I'm going to stand right there because you're my only hope. You're it. Now, there's another story in Luke 18 where Luke is, Jesus is teaching the disciples about prayer again, and he's teaching them this, this another parable about prayer, and he uses this example of a woman, and she goes up to an unjust judge. Now, this judge is not a fair judge. He's not a judge that, that uh, has compassion or has a heart, and Jesus paints that picture for his disciples, and he says, no, 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 no. This woman goes up, and she keeps going up for justice. So she's in a situation where she needs justice in her life and she can't seem to get it. And so she keeps going to the judge over and over and over again. And Jesus ends that story with saying basically, the judge grants the woman her wish because he knew that she would just keep showing up. He was annoyed. He was like, this woman just won't leave me alone. Fine. If I just give her the justice that she wants, then she'll go away. Persistent prayers. Persistence. Jesus wants us to be persistent because he knows that we need to be persistent. He knows that, that we need him. He knows that, that, that we, we just, it's in our nature to just give up. It's in our nature just to say like, okay, I'm, I'm done. Like I prayed, God didn't answer that prayer. So, so that prayer is done. Smiley, I can, I'll go ahead and we got, since we got Smiley here, he's going to come out and play the piano, start playing the piano for us while I get ready to wrap up. But guys, bold and persistent prayers. Our persistence is, is us just, is us continually telling God over and over again that we need him. It's us not settling for anything. 
It's us not, not letting go of anything. It's us not giving up on God. What would it be like to be persistent? What would happen in your prayers if you were persistent? If you just said, no, I'm going to beat this door down until you open it. My wife and I, I'll tell you one more personal story before, we, uh, before I pray. But Casey had, had a situation where she was given a visa and it was legal. And then it, it, because of home affairs and things in home affairs, it went to where it was illegal. And we couldn't leave the country for a long time. And I remember one day she was sitting on the couch and she was upset. You know, her grandmother was, was sick and she was wanting to be able to go back to the States and see her grandmother. And this is years ago. And we had already spent probably two years worth of working with a lawyer. I mean, we'd already been praying, fasting for years that God would come through and deliver this miracle of a visa. And so Casey said, you know, she, she said that she just struggled to believe that it was going to, you know, come about. She was going to be able to go home and, and see her grandmother before her grandmother, you know, her grandmother's getting old, you know, getting on in life. And I just said, you know what, babe, we're just going to pray and we're just going to pray for it. We're, we're going to fast for it, but we're going to pray until it happens. And if it doesn't happen, then we're going to praise God for it anyway. And we prayed that a miracle would come through in case he would get a visa. We prayed every day. We started praying at night before we went to bed. We, we just prayed. We fasted. We gave up stuff. We did all these things. We just day in, day out. And guess what? Three more years went by before Casey finally got that visa. Three more years. We prayed every day. Persistent prayer. The reason that God wants us to have persistent prayers is because God knows that he wants something so mature and so good for us that we need to persistently ask for it. We need to persistently invest in it. We need to persistently not give up. How much greater is it that when we get something that we just strive for and strive for and strive for and then we finally get it? It's like God holds all our prayers in his hands. And if we go to God and we ask for things and then God just says, okay, here you go, here you go, here you go. It's like, yes, that's amazing. But it almost loses a little bit of its value. When God holds on to things and he says, no, I want you to work for this a little bit. I want you to have faith in me. I want you to be bold in your prayers. I want you to be persistent in your prayers. And as we're bold and we're persistent and we continue to come to him, it's like he begins to open his fingers up a little bit and he gives us a glimpse of it and just keep praying, keep going, keep praying. And God eventually opens his hands and he gives us those answers. And they may not be what we originally asked for, but guess what? When you persistently pray, when God finally gives you an answer, he opens the door. It turns out it doesn't even, the answer doesn't even matter anymore. Because what matters is you've entered in, into this relationship with your heavenly father that has just been loving you and taking care of you as you've persistently gone to him and you've matured and you've grown and you've found depths of his love because he's loved you in the deep parts that you never thought you could be loved in. And that would have never happened if you didn't persistently, boldly take your prayers to God. That's what, that's what I hope today, I hope you can find some challenge or some, something in what we've said to encourage you. I've lived it, guys. We continue to live it. We live it every day, Casey and I and my family and this church. This church is built on people that took on a building, that took on a risk, that said, no, we're gonna pray. We're gonna persistently pray. We're gonna be bold in what we ask God for. This is a three loaf building. And your soul, as I pray for your soul and for all of those out there that don't know Jesus, you're a ten, that's a 10 loaf prayer. I'll never quit praying for you to have an encounter with God. And I will be bold and I will be persistent and this church has got my back in it. So I'm gonna pray for us because I'm, I'm way over time, which means I get in trouble with family ministries. But I'm gonna pray and uh, then the band's gonna lead us in a worship song and then I'll come up and dismiss us. But while the band sings, I, I want you to think about that question of, of why is it hard for me to pray? And do I know, do I know Jesus? Has there been something said about Jesus today that can open up this amazing world to you? 
that God is just there for you to talk to him and pray. So Lord, I come to you boldly, persistently. I come to you, I pray, Father, that you move in a mighty way across everyone that hears this. I pray, Lord, that as we worship you for one more song, I pray, Father, that you would just fall mightily and that people would hear your voice. Lord, prayer is just talking to you. And I just want a whole bunch of people to know that they can talk to you. In your name, Lord, I pray. Amen. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my song. Yes, Father, you are so good. You are a good, good Father. And thank you that you just want to talk to us. Amen.